Mr. Agnew, I believe that uh, on behalf of the European for Freedom and Democracy, you might have uh, a slight different view, uh, approach, and uh, comments on right, what you heard German. so far. Yes, you're right. Um, uh, yes, technically I, I represent the EFD group. In practice, I'm here to represent the United Kingdom Independence Party, which has the biggest number of MEPs in that group. Uh, in general terms, as far as the CAP is concerned, I feel the European Union has become far too big to have a common agricultural policy. We are looking at countries which have 350 horsepower tractors versus countries that have draft oxen. We're looking at a latitude that extends about 200 north, miles north of the Arctic Circle down to the bottom corner of Cyprus. I personally don't think it's viable, particularly with all the different languages involved. In the UK, we are the second largest net contributor to the, the budget, uh, and it worries me that we have so little control over that money. On a personal basis, yes, I sit on the Agriculture Committee. I am a practicing farmer, and I farm cereals, sugar beet, sheep, and intensive poultry. This gives me a very good insight into the industry. I can walk into a room full of farmers and have something in common with all of them. I feel a lot of the CAP is undermined by WTO membership. It's the WTO that has taken away the idea of guaranteed prices. It's pushing the CAP along a route it never really wanted to travel. The CAP was designed to have high wages, high standards of this, that and the other, and then a rate raise these tariff barriers against everything else. The WTO has ensured that these tariff barriers have come down and we now find ourselves in the worst of both worlds of having to obey all these regulations and yet try and compete on a so-called level playing field. This reform uh, includes these greening measures, all of which I fundamentally disagree with. Uh, they all have a nice idea behind them. It's all this touchy-feely business. It wouldn't have been nice to do something like this. No, we mustn't plough up any permanent pasture. So what is happening in my country? People are ploughing up permanent pasture as hard as they can go before the deadline comes, self-defeating. Then we have this business of having to grow three crops. In my part of the world, it is utterly unnecessary. We don't indulge in monoculture. Apparently that's going on somewhere in, in the European Union, but not in the United Kingdom. This rule is going to hit those that the Greens would, not, would, would want to protect is going to hit small livestock farmers and small arable farmers for different reasons. I won't go into them, but it's totally counterproductive. Then we have this proposal about EFAs, where 7% of any farm must be in somewhere close to nature. Uh, I feel that when wheat is trading at £200 a tonne, to take any land out of production is simply a scandal. You should not be doing it. Martin Housling has made one or two suggestions about what we might do with that land. He's talked about growing proteins on it. I think there could be a WTO challenge on that because we're starting to bring a commodity in to uh, a subsidised situation, and I don't think that that will go ahead. The others have mentioned the unfairness of payments. Some member state farmers get far more than others per hectare. The UK sits somewhere in the middle of that, but I do sympathise with those who are getting a rough deal. It's not what this should be about. Talked about the royal family. Don't forget, Martin, that the UK are net contributors. Uh, the Queen is right to get some of it back again, and I farm very close to her. <laughs> now, another thing I'm worried about, I talked about the size of the, uh, of the block. The three presidencies involved in the negotiations, Cyprus, Ireland, Greece, over the next 15 or 16 months, none of these countries, in my opinion, has a serious arable farming sector. They're either very small, almost biblical type farming, or in the case of Ireland, it's very, very pastoral and grass. So that is missing from this debate. I am very worried about the fact that uh, farmers are supposed to be able to change the climate. I think this is utter nonsense. I disagree entirely that CO levels have anything to do with the way our climate works. I believe that is influenced by solar cycles, lunar cycles, jet streams and ocean currents. Those forecasts that are based on those criteria are accurate. Those that are based on CO2 levels are so inaccurate that 
I lost a third of my sugar beet crop two years ago because it was frozen solid into the ground by so-called global warming. We must just walk right away from that. Part of that now we have these anaerobic digesters, which are supposed to be green energy. They are now have to have maize grown for them, which could be transported 40 miles to them. I think that's absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. As far as GMOs go, I think I was very pro the idea that the decision to grow these crops should go back to member states. It seems to have stumbled. I was one of the trial growers of GM crops a few years ago. I think there's a great deal in it. The Eurozone, we got huge worries in the UK about what happens there in the farming sector. If the Euro, if the Euro flops, it's going to be very difficult for UK farmers because their payments will collapse. On uh, co-ops and prices, I feel that pig producers, milk producers, do have to get together in, in a large enough block to be able to face, take on these supermarkets face to face. We've got to be able to let them do that. The final showdown on all of this will, I think, be dictated by the council. I know you've talked about co-decision, but please remember that we are MEPs. Many MEPs in this parliament belong to, there are members of governing parties, and those governing parties will say to their MEPs, this is how we want you to talk. That is just real life. Righto, I've said plenty to stir you up. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much indeed, and uh, it seems to be quite radical. Huh? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> good. I, I, I believe we will have some uh, reactions. But and I want to reiterate my earlier point. In the Agriculture Committee, we have a a, a similar position. All of us do have uh, a, a common attitude to, towards farming. Even Mr Agnew has shown a, a positive approach towards farming. And you can see clearly where the majorities are and that's how you do it, uh, how you build compromise amendments. So uh, I am not as concerned as some may well be that we will end up with a disunited position. Uh, clearly my colleague Mr Agnew won't vote for anything because he doesn't believe in the institution at all. Uh, and unlike the, the majority of the rest of his members, at least he does turn up now and again, so I suppose that's always something to be grateful for. Uh, but uh, the, big, the big political groups will, I think, find good compromises. Mr Agnew, after you react. Yeah, please. Mr Agnew redet zwar mit, aber er wird am Ende immer dagegen. Mr Agnew uh, is talking as if it's part of the debate, but he'll always oppose whatever the result is uh, of something decided at the EU. So he's putting a lot of effort into it, but he's always going to disagree. Anyway, the fact that there's so many amendments surprised us all, but I would see that as a positive thing. In Parliament, there's a lot of interest in agricultural reform. Mr Agnew, kind of... Uh yeah, reaction from the strong thanks, minority, yeah, well, both well, to Mr. Lyon and uh, Housling. Un unsurprisingly, my colleagues mentioned my name. I wouldn't be doing my job if they didn't. The questioner expressed surprise that we haven't all come to one lovely, cosy agreement against the Commission. I'm surprised that you are surprised, because here are 20, how many countries? 27 countries with completely different political spectrums. You're not going to get agreement. My own method of voting, right. I take the following philosophy. I know that these final votes will always go through. I therefore try and tweak the thing with the way I vote on amendments, because I will always vote against the final vote. We look at the amendments. I look at the amendments with my assistant. Would voting yes help British farmers, or would voting yes help British taxpayers? And by that I mean stop wastage on some of the extraordinary schemes that we have heard. Um, does that answer their questions? That's how I operate. Oh, I should say I am elected to this place, <laughs> and I'm responsible to those who elect me. And my party is growing in the United Kingdom. So you may write me off with, sne with sneers and patronising looks. We are growing. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Mr. Agnew, you would like to? Yes, Chairman. Well, what, what about if the, the council, the member states, are not uh, agreeing in November? There might be some uh, blood on the walls oh, if they fight. Well, there almost certainly will be. I won't go into that. I just do want to talk about the, um, the renewable energy. What we are witnessing is a scam or a Ponzi scheme of monumental proportions. Yes, farmers like it because they're paid huge subsidies to have these wind turbines or solar panels on their land. And what's more, they can farm around them, particularly with livestock. They're not sacrificing a great deal of land. 
Many of them still think that these subsidies come from taxpayers. Actually, they don't. They come from electricity consumers who may well be very poor individuals. So what we're seeing is a reverse of the Robin Hood principle. We're robbing the poor to pay the rich. It is absolutely disgraceful. On top of that, these wind turbines are so unreliable, they need gas-fired power stations to back them up. It's called spinning reserve. The gas-fired the gas power station is running, pushing out CO2, if you're interested in that, so what's the point? You may as well have that working anyway. I do agree with Martin, yes, it can happen. I agree with you on biomass first generation, that planting huge areas of maize to transport several miles to put in an aerobic digester, digester is just a nonsense. On second generation, yes, crop residues, if you can do it efficiently, why not? Thank you. Mr. Agnew and then Mr. Rosling. Uh, I will ask you to be short because we yeah. still have three questions and right. we have to stop at one o'clock. So uh, okay, on, on, on the greening, uh, I think this is, on the EFAs, this is going to impose a massive red tape burden onto farms. I, some of them here say I don't do anything. It was me who got Chillis to agree in the plenary chamber to the fact that environmental schemes, land in those, would count towards the 7%. I do take credit for that, even if the others don't give it to me. But if you look at the burden of red tape, you've got to decide how wide is a hedge. That is an environmental feature. But how wide is it? We know the length. That's got to be decided. The same applies to a green lane. Is it a road? Or is it actually an area of grassland? These are just two examples. The other thing you pointed out, the man from Italy over there, are thresholds. I think they are far, far too low. They're talking about a farm as something that's more than eight acres. I would suggest that at eight acres, you are effectively a little plot of land. You really do not need to grow three crops on eight acres. Thank you. Rosling, shortly, please. Yes, yeah, very, very quickly. The milk quota question, well, that's really pre-reform. We're not really dealing with that per se. That was decided some time ago. You've got to consider the WTO involvement in this. So it really is it's history now. If our dairy farmers want better prices, they have got to get together. And these co-ops must shed uh, some of this infighting, etc. I won't go any, into that any further, but milk quotas are history. Um, well, one of my colleagues here has confirmed what I said about the UK being the second large, largest contributor and levelling. This is supposed to be the common agricultural policy. The longer it tolerates this complete unevenness to a huge degree, it cannot call itself common. Thank you. Thank you.